Well, this morning, as we turn to God's Word, we're returning to our current series, walking through uh, the final chapters of the Old Testament book of Daniel. And I've been calling this series, Daniel, chapters uh, 7 through 12, The Visions, and it's important to note that chapters 10, 11, and 12 together uh, form the climactic conclusion to the, uh, to the book of Daniel. Uh, these chapters record the final vision that demonstrates over and over that God is the ruling king of heaven and earth. Let me put it to you this way. The Lord reigns. He declares the end from the beginning. Daniel 4.17 is really a summary of the entire, uh, of the message of the entire book. The Most High rules the kingdom of men. And today we'll be turning to the end of Daniel, so to chapter 11, verse 20, through chapter 12, and verse 13. And this passage can be described as a wild ride. We're considering prophecies spanning Daniel's day all the way through to the glorious and yet future glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can sum up everything that we're going to say this morning by saying this. God reveals that the future will be a wild ride. Times of difficulty are on the horizon, but in the midst of this, we ought to find enduring and rock-solid comfort in remembering that God is in absolute control. Hold tightly, friends, to that truth. God is in absolute control. And, And keeping a proper perspective and continually remembering that God is in control enables us to stand firm. And that key phrase, those two words, stand firm, appears in chapter 11 and verse 32, uh, the second half of the verse, saying this, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. I want to uh, begin reading at chapter 11 and verse 20. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. In his place shall arise a contemptible person, to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and shall obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully and shall become strong with a small people. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province and shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. And he shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a vast, uh, with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, But he shall not stand, for plots shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him. And his army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on uh, doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For the end is yet to be at the time appointed. And he shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set on the holy co- uh, set against the holy covenant, and he shall work his will and return to his own land. And at that at the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, uh, but it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Katim uh, shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw and turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the holy covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress. And they shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up an abomination that makes desolate. And he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame and by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble uh, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. Like I said, this passage could be described as a wild ride, 
And this first section contains prophecies concerning the oppression of God's people during the absolutely wicked rule of a man by the name of Antiochus IV Epiphanes. This is a troubling picture, and Bible scholars agree that it describes a king of the Seleucid Empire, which was one of the empires that came out of the El empire of Alexander the Great. And this guy, Antiochus, uh, called himself Epiphanes, or God manifest. Can you see the problem? This guy was a monster and a madman. And some made a play on words. Remember, he called himself Epiphanes, but they, but they called him Epenemies, meaning madman, which describes well his wicked rule. Uh, his rule was incomprehensibly wicked between 175 and 164 B.C., and it included tremendously brutal persecution of God's people. You might remember the little horn of Daniel chapter 8 prophesying Antiochus Epiphanes as well. But a quick review, going back a couple weeks, to the first half of the chapter, chapter 11 of the book of Daniel, uh, verses 1 through 19, uh, and just reviewing a little bit is helpful here. The beginning of the chapter prophesied in incredible detail. It's actually been described and well described as pre-written history. And it described a back-and-forth war that would uh, come between the king of the north and the king of the south. And, and there'll be a map behind me. I don't know if I'll use the, well, I guess I can use the pointer here. But you see that Syria, and that was the kingdom of the north up here, and then Egypt, that was the kingdom of the south. And what's in the middle? And none other than the land of Israel. Uh, so Israel was in the, middle, uh, in the middle of this war that could be described as a tennis match. Back and forth, up and down, a seesaw, the king of the north, then the king of the south, coming and going, uh, this war. And of course, like I said, Israel and God's people were in the middle of this up and down and back and forth prolonged struggle between rival empires. And then Antiochus IV Epiphanes came to power, and he was a king of the north. That means he was from Syria. And so in the near term, this prophetic picture that I just read predicts the horrors of his evil reign. But it also foreshadows the Antichrist and his rule during the end times something that we're going to focus on more specifically in verses 36 to 45. But here are just a few things. Embrace yourself. This isn't like happy discussion. This isn't a happy topic. But just here are a few of the things that Antiochus did. He made it his personal ambition to completely destroy the Jewish faith before the coming of the Messiah. And obviously Satan himself was involved in this spiritual battle to destroy the line of the Messiah. Antiochus' wicked, Antiochus's wicked actions were a direct attack, attack against God himself. This was a time of incredible suffering for God's people. He entered the temple, did away with the daily sacrifice, dedicated the temple to the Greek god Zeus, and sacrificed pigs on the temple altar. Do you remember the Levitical law in kosher Pigs were the most unclean animal. So just brace yourself and understand kind of what he did. But worse than that, he made it a capital offense. That means death to have a copy of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. He made it a capital offense to be circumcised or to celebrate any of the Jewish festivals. And we know this from the books of Maccabees, that fit historically between the last book of our Old Testament and the coming of Christ in the beginning of the Gospels. Uh, there'll be a map behind me. You'll see again the Middle East. Uh, that was where all of this happened. And then there'll be a map of the temple. Uh, and this was actually Herod's temple, so it became even a little bit nicer uh, hundreds of years after Antiochus because Herod expanded it. But this is Jerusalem and the temple complex. And now I want to show a picture of Herod's temple, which again was a, a, a few years later, uh, but it was built on the same foundation. Kind of imagine him going in here and doing the things that I just said that he did. And just let that jar you for a minute. And you say, well, I'm glad that that doesn't happen today. Wrong. 
There are places in the world today where having a Bible could cost you imprisonment or even your life. We're gathering together with uh, fellow Christians is very, very dangerous. And anyway, this time of persecution was absolutely awful and blood flowed in Jerusalem. This man's wickedness is just about incomprehensible. History records him killing 80,000 people around Jerusalem and selling tens of thousands of slaves. Verses 30 and 31, For ships of Katim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay, atten uh, and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and he shall take away the regular burnt offering. Did you catch that? Uh, stopping offering at the temple, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Now, it is interesting because at Daniel's time, the temple was a pile of rubble. So there actually was some good news in this alarming vision is that the temple would indeed be rebuilt because it hadn't been rebuilt yet. But history records that a Roman general met him, that's Antiochus, and as he was seeking to attack Egypt and told him to withdraw or face war with Rome. And then this Roman general took out his sword and drew a circle in the sand around this evil man and said, you will answer before you step over the line and step out of the circle that I just drew. Well, Antiochus had no choice facing the military might of Rome, and he withdrew. But then what do totalitarian dictator creeps do when they meet, when they meet their match? They withdraw and go and pick on somebody that they can pick on, right? And that's exactly what he did. He left Egypt, and enraged, he went back and turned back and vented his rage on Jerusalem and on the temple and set up the abomination that makes desolate. And this, of course, is a phrase in a picture that Jesus himself picks up in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 when teaching about the end times. Now, you say, everything I've just said, you go, Pastor Dave, that is alarming. I wish we hadn't gone there. Well, it's God's word. We, we absolutely need to go there. But I want you to see something hopeful, too. In the middle of all of this mess, can you see who's in control? There's a key word. If you like to mark in your Bible, you might want to mark these. It's the word appointed. In verse 27, for the end is yet to be at the time, get this, appointed. Or verse 29, the time appointed. In verse 35, for it still awaits the appointed time. This tells us something vitally important. Even in the midst of this horrible time of incredibly intense suffering, God did not let go of being in control. And in the midst of all of this mess, listen to how the faithful are described. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Verse 32. And eventually, the Maccabees reconquered Jerusalem, recaptured the temple, and rededicated it. And actually, the Jewish festival today of Hanukkah commemorates that event. The Maccabees, a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus, he was known as the Hammer, a brave warrior who recaptured Jerusalem. But in all of this, we see that God is in control. He told his people, that this period of intense suffering was coming some 300 years before it occurred. We often don't understand what God is doing in the midst of suffering, but we know that he declares the end from the beginning. And that, my friends, is tremendously comforting. Well, now I want to turn to prophecies pointing to the future beyond Antiochus Epiphanes to the wicked rule of the Antichrist in the end times. And, and these verses are difficult to interpret, and not all Christians agree uh, about how to understand them, so it's important to be charitable. Uh, that said, we mustn't skip this passage of God's Word, because this is God's Word, and we need all of God's Word. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture, did you catch that? Not some. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof for correction, 
and for training in righteousness. So I'm going to turn to verses 36 to 45. And the king shall do as he wills, and he shall exalt himself and magnify him above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all, and he shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these." A God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, uh, th- um, those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor, and he shall make them rulers over many, and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. But the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into the countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. But these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of of um, he shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train but news from the east and from the north shall alarm him and he shall go out in a great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction and he shall pitch his uh, palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain yet he shall come to his end with none to help him uh, so the challenge in interpreting uh, this Uh, is that it's clear that in verses 20 to 35, we're speaking about the evil exploits of Antiochus IV Epiphanes in the 160s BC. But then there seems to be a switch, and the focus turns to more than the historical, for us, but future for Daniel, Antiochus IV. And and uh, some of the details don't seem to fit with his life, and it appears to be looking beyond the 160s BC, Uh, especially the details surrounding the death of the person pictured here in verse 45. Uh, So I'm convinced that what we just read in verses 36 to 45 point beyond Antiochus to the Antichrist. And the reason that all of this fits together is because there are incredible similarities between them. Antiochus IV foreshadows or prototypes the Antichrist. Some have called him an Old Testament antichrist because of the similarities. They're so close. I'd put it this way. Antiochus IV Epiphanes' actions before Jesus' first coming point forward to the antichrist and his actions before Christ's second coming. I think that's a very accurate way to describe it. And in these verses, we read that he will forsake the gods of his fathers, that small g, and worship military power. That's worshiping the god of fortresses in in verse 30. We read that there will be a final battle in Israel, which is also described in the book of Revelation. If you've heard the word Armageddon, that's what this is. And now when we think about it, the pattern of ruthless world dictators setting themselves up against God and seeking to destroy biblical faith is nothing new. It's been a pattern that resounds and is repeated throughout history. Uh, So in a sense, Daniel is an uncomfortable reality check because it reminds us that suffering for Christ has been the norm throughout history. The blessings and peace that we've experienced are the exception, not the norm. Of course, we're looking at Antiochus IV Epiphanes, but think of the Roman emperors Nero and Domitian, to mention a few. There were others, and their absolutely brutal, diabolical persecution of Christians. But the pattern continues, and think of the 20th century and the horrors of Hitler and Stalin and others, and the pattern continues. And it will ultimately culminate in the time of the end before Christ's return 
in the person and work of none other than the Antichrist himself. 1 John 2.18 says this, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come, therefore we know that it is the last hour. Here, the Antichrist is coming, but the Antichrists are already here. It's a pattern that's been fulfilled throughout history. Or 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, Let no one deceive you in any way, for the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So here we're looking in Daniel, but we're also looking at 1 John, the Antichrist, same, same, one, same person, same evil ruler, the man of lawlessness, or the beast in Revelation 13 and the number 666 and all of that, talking about the same thing. These verses look forward to a world leader setting himself up against God and suppressing biblical faith. And along with Daniel, we're looking into the future for the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy. That said, I want us to catch this. Even when it looks like evil is winning, God is never caught off guard. He wins in the end. And this should comfort us. God declares the end from the beginning. And I want to read chapter 12 because notice the hope of chapter 12 against the horrible backdrop that we just discussed. At that time, so the, the time that we just read about, that you're going in a word, yikes. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name is uh, found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words of this and seal the book for uh, until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on the other bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? You're probably wondering the same question, right? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time times and half a time and that when the shattering of the holy people comes to an end all these things would be finished i heard but i did not understand then i said oh my lord what shall be the outcome of these things he said go your way daniel for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined but uh, uh, the wicked shall be, act wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Uh, but it is, uh, blessed is he who waits for uh, the, and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way to the end, and you shall rest and you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. The glorious ending. God is triumphant. He is king. And these verses turn our eyes to the certain hope of the resurrection. The English Standard Version titles these verses I just read, The Time of the End. Some other Bible translations say, The End Times. Now, of course, these section titles are not inspired scripture, but in my judgment, they're correct. The chapter deals with the end times, dealing with what was not only future for Daniel, but also future for us. The phrase, the time of the end, or the end of days, appears in verses 4, verse 9, and verse 13. And notice that there are angels talking to each other over the river. And this looks back to the beginning of the vision in chapter 10. I won't turn there now in this, for the sake of time, but this is the same picture that we saw at the beginning of the vision in chapter 10. 
So the vision ends where it began. And we need to connect the words of verse 1 with the end of verse 11, or the end of chapter 11, describing the horrors of the Antichrist. There will indeed be a period of intense suffering and distress caused by the Antichrist prior to Jesus' second coming. This is the tribulation. And yes, it might feel unsettling and might leave us saying, yikes. But remember that tribulation, small t, suffering for Christ is the norm throughout history, and it points forward to the ultimate culmination, you might say tribulation, capital T. The end of chapter 11, and he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to, the, to an end with no one to help him. And then chapter 12, remembering what I just read, verses 1 and 2. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name is found written in the book. In Revelation, that's described as the Lamb's book of life. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then the very end of Daniel, but go your way to the end, Daniel, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Notice the assurance to Daniel as his head is spinning. The angel assures him. But here, see, the glory of the resurrection provides incredible hope. The righteous and the wicked are raised. Jesus teaches about this in John 5, 28 and 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in their tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Friends, pondering all of this makes faithfulness today worth it. Pause here and ponder and let the hope of the resurrection inform and form your perspective. Reward is certain for the righteous and judgment is is certain for the wicked. No matter how bad things might look at the moment, God is always in control, and he will win the victory in the end. God's people, who are downtrodden in the present, will experience the indescribable joy of everlasting life in the presence of the Lord, uh, and evil will be dealt with. These promises are not hollow. They are the certain future. God declares the end from the beginning. And all of this leaves us facing an important question. In verse 2, we saw that multitudes or many who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And, and that leads all of us to ask some questions. Which will describe me? Everlasting life? or everlasting contempt. Our personal response to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his death on the cross is the dividing line between everlasting life and everlasting contempt. Ask yourself, is my name written in the Lamb's book of life? Perhaps you need to invite Jesus to be your personal Savior today. I'd encourage you to do just that. Perhaps in your own words, you need to say something like this. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for, me, for my sins. At this very moment, I trust you as Savior and Lord. Make me the type of person you created me to be. And it's in your name that we pray. Perhaps, amen. Perhaps you need to make that kind of commitment in your own words, make that commitment. Don't wait. We want eternal life. We know that these events in history, at the end of history will happen, but we don't know exactly when they will occur, but we know that they will occur according to God's perfect timing and plan. There's even specific times mentioned. 
And I'm not going to try to explain what all of it means because I don't know exactly. Times, time, and half a time. 1,290 days, 1,335 days. But it's all according to God's plan. And now as we turn to the Lord's table, I want us to think about this. Galatians 4, 4 and 5 says this. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Or these words from Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless man. That, men. That's Peter preaching in the book of Acts. Jesus came according to God's perfect plan. Perfect timing. And he went to the cross to make a way so that all who place their faith and trust in him can look forward to the days and say, yes, there will be trouble at the end. And there's trouble throughout history. But yes, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and I am awaking to everlasting life in the presence of of the Lord, the hope of resurrection. And so ask yourself, have I received the forgiveness that is freely offered through the cross, through Christ's resurrection? Because, friends, we all need God's grace and mercy. Without it, we'd be doomed. And the Lord's Supper is only for those who are followers of Jesus. So if you haven't yet come to the place of placing your faith, your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone to save you, I'd encourage you to do that today. But please, until that's true for you, let the elements respectfully pass by. Because we're celebrating that Christ died, as he died on the cross, he was paying the penalty for our sins so that we can be forgiven. We're proclaiming the gospel in a way that we act out by eating and drinking together. His body was broken and his blood was shed so that we can be saved. Hear these words. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite those who are serving to come forward. And then uh, there'll be some music. And I invite you to take this time to reflect on the gospel and to reflect on what Christ has done so that we can be saved, so that we can enjoy the hope, the certain hope of eternal life, so that we can look forward with blessed hope to the return of, the, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in love you sent your only Son, the second person of the Trinity, very God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, to this sin-sick, fallen world so that we can be saved. And now, Lord, this morning, as we eat the bread and drink the cup together, may we proclaim the gospel in a way that is spiritually nourishing for us. May we look forward to your return. Look forward to being with you in glory. Look forward to the resurrection. And look forward in hope, knowing that you are in control. Knowing that even in uh, whatever may come, that you are in control. And that you, Lord Jesus, are coming back. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.